In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So theologian uh, Richard Rohr has a uh, daily meditation that hits my inbox at around 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, so it's the first email usually when I wake up in the morning. And as I was reading it today, uh, it echoed what I talked about a couple weeks ago with our adults at our first uh, Sunday evening gathering as we were talking about how our children develop their idea of faith. Um, and the general rule of thumb is that we start with order. We create the security that we need uh, to grow and thrive. And our first images of God usually come from our parents. And we develop a theology that gives us security and the assurance that everything's going to be okay. And then as we grow a little older, some of us hold on really tightly to that. And some of us uh, stay there in that place within that security. And others sort of push against it. Uh, well, most push against it. But sometimes when you push against it, you prefer to fall back into that security. And sometimes you sort of push against it and then walk outside it. Uh, and live amidst the disorder, the chaos of trying to figure out how the world works uh, when the, sec the secure theology of your childhood uh, no longer holds or no longer answers all of those uh, intellectual questions that you might have or as you've experienced uh, tragedy and other things in your life that don't necessarily fit into that secure understanding of who God is and how God connects to you uh, that you might have had from your childhood. Uh, and so you live, uh, and this drives parents nuts this season, uh, where their children live through that period of, uh, of disorder, uh, of reacting against uh, at least the institutional church, if not uh, uh, the idea of God uh, itself. And then uh, and then as we put together the pieces, we reorder uh, our, our faith, and, then, and that's sort of the process of developing an owned faith. Uh, and some people don't go through that whole process, but, uh, but many do, and it, uh, uh, it's not an easy process. Uh, and I did describe on that Sunday my own process, which, which kind of mirrored that. Uh, when I was a child, we moved around a lot, and church provided me great comfort and security wherever we moved. Um, I do uh, treasure my relationship with my parents and do believe that they formed my first understanding of who God uh, is in my life. Um, and my community of faith did everything it could uh, uh, to make me feel secure and assure me uh, that as long as I kept my nose clean and was a good boy, uh, that God would take care of me and nothing bad would happen. Uh, and that cocoon was a wonderful place to grow up. Uh, but I remember intellectually, uh, in my teen years, I was pushing against it, uh, and it didn't seem uh, to hold, uh, but I still loved the institution of the church. Uh, and, and then when I got to college, things happened emotionally uh, that left me on the ground, uh, convinced that the faith of my childhood was cracked forever. Uh, people died uh, uh, tragically. Uh, I dealt with uh, great-grandparents and elders dying, uh, but when uh, people my age were dying uh, or people uh, uh, just a little bit older than me were getting diagnoses of terminal cancer, uh, of these things where I saw wonderful people uh, going through tragedies that didn't make sense, uh, I didn't have a container for that. Um, the world didn't make sense. Uh, and we push towards the security of a world that makes sense. We understand the person that smokes three packs a day uh, gets emphysema. Uh, that makes sense to us. Or the person that uh, uh, pays no attention to their diet, that's never exercised a day in their life, uh, has heart disease. That makes sense. Uh, but when the person who, uh, who was a health nut their whole life uh, gets diagnosed with lung cancer or drops dead, it doesn't make sense and we can't stand that because that means it could happen to us or the people closest to us. It means that we can't hedge our bets, that faith is not an insurance policy and that scares us. Think of all the ways uh, that we try to control our lives and we want our faith to do the same. And I think that's not an uncommon trait. I remember when I was first ordained, uh, the number of people who were convinced, even though it caused them additional distress, um, that they were being punished for sins uh, that they had done. 
Uh, when they needed God more than anything, uh, they felt like God had no room for them uh, because God was punishing them because of uh, their lax church attendance or because uh, of uh, something they did to a, a friend or because they, were, uh, the, they weren't speaking to their parents or a sibling uh, and they were con or because of uh, some sin they did uh, uh, that undercut somebody else. Uh, they were convinced that was the reason that they were befalling uh, whatever tragedy was going on in their lives. Uh, and when they needed reconciliation, forgiveness, and grace more than anything, uh, God was the actor uh, of, of their suffering because they needed the world to make sense. And in the first century, they did that uh, very much as well. Uh, the prevalent theology at Jesus' time was if you were poor, it was because God didn't favor you as well as he favored the wealthy. And that way, uh, the wealthy didn't have to uh, part with a lot of their wealth because uh, God wouldn't have given them all that money if God didn't want them to have all that money. Uh, and God wouldn't have made that other person poor uh, generationally if God didn't want them to be poor generationally. And if you got sick, uh, all they really knew about making people well uh, was that sick people seemed to beget more sick people. Um, and they didn't have the medical expertise to cure a lot of things. So if you were sick, uh, you were put outside of the, uh, of the town. You, you slept outside the town. Uh, you, you might be in uh, solidarity with other people who were uh, excised from their family and their faith communities and, and, um, and any chance of a gainful employment outside of the town. Uh, but you were separated from your community. Uh, and the rationale behind why that was acceptable to God was that they were being punished for either their sins or the sins of their family members before them. And it made them okay. And we're a little naive if we don't think we do a little bit of that ourselves. The idea that we are as prominent as we are, that we are as successful as we are entirely because of our own merit uh, is a little bit of the same naivete. And that those that aren't are because that they didn't work as hard as us. Uh, if Ben Moss were honest with myself, I would say I was born almost uh, crossing home base, uh, and I haven't screwed it up too badly, I don't think. Uh, but that's, that's my truth. This thing that gives me security and comfort in my prosperity, however, uh, however uh, modest it might be, uh, is that I've earned everything that I have. But all of us create that own narrative. And so Jesus comes in and he starts to poke at it. And he says, you know what? Do you think those people uh, who died a horrific death, who Herod killed as they were making sacrifices to God uh, and, and left them uh, bleeding with their sacrifices uh, in that, uh, you know, he's pretty much pulling out the headlines. Uh, take the, the shooting in the mosque in New Zealand. Uh, take the, uh, uh, the things that don't make the headlines, the murders in Chicago. Take the people who uh, die of hunger uh, around the world. Take all of those stories. Uh, Jesus is reading from the same headlines. Do these people matter less to God? Did God love them less? Are their sins any greater than anyone else because Herod uh, killed them to make an example of them? Are the people that walked uh, past the Tower of Siloam, that you have walked a hundred times, uh, they just happened to walk when the tower fell over, are they loved any less by God? Were they any more uh, to blame for their own death than you are for making it across that path safely? No. This passage isn't one of the most well-known passages, but I have to say, when I started putting together the pieces of my faith, when I started to figure out how do I reconcile an all-loving God uh, with the things that happen in the world? This was one of the most important passages. And it gave me a love of a God who wasn't playing us like a chessboard, uh, but who cried even more passionately for the things that God had to watch happen than if God moved those people out of the way of that tower and made a less arbitrary and a more loving God in my heart. And so that was one of the pieces of me rebuilding my faith. Uh, but that's one half of this gospel lesson. The other half, I think, is very much related to it. The parable of the fig tree is seen in the concert in context with this first half of the reading. So God says, you're not being punished uh, for the things that you've done wrong. Uh, God is merciful and God is reconciling. And the people that, have, uh, that show up on the front page of the paper are not notorious sinners any more than you are. Uh, but, but. That doesn't mean everybody has a free pass. And that doesn't mean that the life that you've been given doesn't matter. What you do with everything I've given you matters. 
Don't forget that. And that's the second parable. That's the parable, the second half of this. Uh, he tells the story of the fig tree. Uh, and uh, unlike any fig tree that we've ever had, the fig trees in the Middle East, uh, where it was the, the perfect climate for a fig tree, not much else, um, they bloomed or bore fruit at least three times a year, generally. And so to miss three years of, of, of producing fruit, this fig tree basically missed nine cycles. Um, and uh, fig trees were both ubiquitous uh, and required absolutely no care. So the idea that this fig tree that hadn't blossomed in three years uh, should be cut down made perfect sense to everybody who was listening. The fact that it wouldn't be cut down is actually the absurdity. And not only does uh, Jesus say, uh, the gardener, Jesus say it shouldn't be cut down, uh, but we should dig around it and we should put manure in it and we should uh, take care of it. It's a little bit like tending to a dandelion. People wouldn't do it. It's as absurd as the parable of the uh, person casting precious seed on all kinds of soil. But Jesus is telling us two things. One, that the God who seeks justice, that a God who cares about how you live your life and about the decisions you make is also a God of grace who will work with you, who will never give up on you, who continually calls you to calibrate, to take stock of how you're living the life you've been given. How are you blossoming into the person that God made you to be? I think it's worth taking a look at that first lesson where Moses is standing on hollowed ground as we think about that. Moses is given an incredible task by God. Liberate my people. Go and set my people free. I've seen what they're going through and you go and free my people from the Egyptians. And he says, Lord, you can't possibly mean me. I've got a speech impediment. Uh, I'm on the, the run. Uh, I've killed somebody. You can't mean me. Which we all do. We all come up with a whole lot of ways to stay in our secure life, in our home. But God says, you, Moses, you've been given everything that you need to do this. Go and set my people free. God is telling each one of us, you've been given all the gifts that you need, and I will fertilize and care for you all the way through. But lead meaningful lives. Not as an insurance policy, but because that's what you were made to do. To be my blossoms, to be my fruit in the world. So go and bear fruit. Amen.